Math 1314, Tyler Jr. College, section 2.6, combinations of functions, composite functions, decomposing functions. Disclaimer, from a strictly college algebra perspective, this is not something that we would build on later. This is just a topic extension to see how much we can elevate our minds. However, for those of you heading towards calculus and beyond, there will be some spots in calculus, maybe about 30% of the way through, where you have to view functions as compositions of other functions. And then once you see it in calculus, it never, ever, ever goes away. So consider this either a topic extension for college algebra students or a warning for uh, future calculus students. Decomposing functions is exactly what it sounds like. We have a composition and we want to find two functions, excuse me, we have a composition that already existed and we want to recover two functions that created that composition. In other words, what two functions could we compose to get the square root of x squared plus one? Now, I'm going to show you a technique that works for many functions but not all of them. And I should tell you that the answer to this is never unique. In fact, I would go out on a limb and say that there are an infinite number of solutions to this. From a calculus perspective, you always want to find the easiest one. So if you want to go for a challenge, I dare you to find, I don't know, 11 pairs of functions who do this. But how do you find a simple pair? Well, the trick to function composition, or rather function decomposition, is to ask yourself, in order, what does this function do to the x? It's an order of operations thing. In other words, if I substitute a number for the x, what happens to it? The first thing that happens is the x gets squared. What's the second thing that happens? We add 1. And what's the third thing that happens? We square root. So how can we use this to decompose a function into the composition of two functions? By splitting this into two separate lists of steps. Now, we have two options on how to split it. We can split it, the first two and then the third by itself. Let's try that. Answer. To decompose a function, you start with the inner function. The inner function starts at the beginning of this list and stops where you choose to stop it. So we're going to make the first function, the inner function, square and then add 1. Square and then add 1. So g of x will take something, square it, and then add 1. So inner function. The outer function is the remainder of the list. f of x equals well, the only thing left is the square root, so I need a function of the square roots. And if you wanted to check it, f of g of x, by definition, is f of g of x. You replace the inner function, the inner function is x squared plus 1, and then you apply the outer function to the inner function. If we square root this, we get the square root of x squared plus 1. Ta-da! Function decomposition. List and steps the actions that happen to the x. Split that list somewhere. Top of the list is your first function's action. Bottom of the list is the second function's action. But notice I said split it anywhere. Let's say one answer over here. f of x equals the square root of x. g of x equals x squared plus 1. That got the job done. But that's if we split that list between the second and third steps. What if we split it between the first and second steps and split it here, inner and outer? What would the inner function be then? A function that takes something and squares it, so g of x equals x squared. And what would the outer function be? The function that takes something, adds 1 to it, and then square roots. Would that work? Well, f of g of x is f of g of x. Starting on the inside, g of x is replaced with x squared. Now we have to do what f does to that. 
F says, give me something, I will add one to it and then square root. That's what F does. It's doing it to X squared. Parentheses aren't necessary. And there's a second answer. Now you may be wondering, you said there were an infinite number of functions that would do this, and I'm not wrong. Because we could actually trick this out some. Now once I show you how to trick this out, which is not necessary to answer this question, it's already been answered not once but twice, but just to convince you that there's an infinite number of ways to do this, what if I took the already created composition, square root of x squared plus 1. Well, look at that space in there. Why is there a space in there? Because I'm going to insert two numbers that cancel. How about minus 5 and plus 5? They would cancel, and I would get back to there. But now I can look at this as the square root of x squared minus 5 plus 6. Doesn't that still equal plus 1? And now there are four things being done. Square, minus 5, plus 6, and then square root. So if I split it right down the middle, the inner function would be the function that performs the first two moves, square something and then subtract 5, and then the outer function, f of x, would be the function that does the last two moves. Give me something, add 6 to it, and then take the square root. Why minus 5 and plus 5? I could have used any number. I could have used minus 10 plus 10, minus pi plus pi, and I could have done plus minus. By artificially creating more steps, I create more options on how to build this function. And because this 5 could have been any number, these could have been an infinite number of pairs of functions. So I wasn't kidding when I said for any function composition, there's an infinite number of ways to make it happen. But don't be fancy, especially in a calculus class. Don't be cute and try to do something like that. That's just for theoretical purposes to back up the claim that there's an infinite pair of functions that I can make that have this composition. From a calculus perspective, you would want to think of it probably as this way. Uh, because from a calculus perspective, you want the outer function to be as simplistic as possible. Usually. You'll see when you get there. If you're going there. 